So in this video, we want to talk about the effects of mutation. What happens when the DNA code changes? That's essentially what a mutation is. The answer is that the effects might vary uh, dramatically, depending on what type of mutation is occurring and where the mutation occurred. So let's explore some of that in this video. Uh, remember again, I just said that the mutation is just simply defined as when the DNA master code changes. That's going to have an impact because every mRNA copy of it will also be changed. And depending on how um, uh, the protein is built and where the mutation occurred, it might cause all kinds of interesting effects on proteins, potentially. Um, what causes mutations to occur? Remember that there's just a natural uh, mutation rate that occurs. Uh, when DNA is replicated, anytime it's replicated, say before mitosis or before meiosis, when you make gametes, there's just a natural rate of error that occurs um, due to base pairing problems. Base pairs uh, pair correctly maybe um, 99,999 times out of 100,000, but when you're copying billions of nucleotides, there are plenty of mistakes that can uh, crop up. Many organisms have proofreading proteins to try and correct those errors and reduce the error rate, but the error rate is not zero. Uh, what else can cause mutations? Um, there are environmental factors that can damage DNA and increase the rate of mutation. Um, generally, that those come in two broad forms. Um, radiation from high energy waves like gamma rays and x-rays can damage DNA. And so can chemical sources like, say, cigarettes. Uh, the chemicals in cigarettes, I should say. So what could the effects of mutation be? Well, mutations themselves aren't good, bad, or neutral. Mutations are just changes. And so when we think about biological mutations and their effect on phenotype, we're ultimately going to have to get to evolution and the idea of natural selection to talk about a beneficial mutation versus a, a problematic mutation. Because ultimately, um, it really depends upon the environmental context that the organism is living in. Uh, for example, albinism is something that uh, uh, can occur in, in a variety of species um, to make their fur color white instead of pigmented in fur color. Um, that might be a real advantage potentially in, say, a snowy forest, um, but perhaps not an advantage in a grassland. Um, so even the same mutation might be extremely beneficial in one environmental context, um, but extremely um, deleterious in another. So ultimately, mutation just generates the variety, and then a selective force will decide whether that, that change is um, to be passed on to the lineage, through the lineage, uh, or perhaps not. So let's talk about how mutations might affect DNA. Um, mutations can occur anywhere in the DNA code, um, perhaps even in regions that don't code for proteins, um, or sort of non-genes. And so you say, all right, well, if the DNA code isn't coding for genes, then I guess it won't have any effect at all. We're starting to discover that, that regions that don't code for genes might still have important functions. So that's really not necessarily the case, although many regions um, that don't code for genes can tolerate mutation. Um, one example of that uh, really causing a problem, though, might be, say, the centromere region. Uh, remember that the centromere was really important for getting cell division done correctly. Uh, perhaps mutations to the centromere region are really not tolerated well. Um, but we're going to focus in this video on regions that code for genes. Um, we kind of de defined a gene rather broadly in the last video. We said that the, a gene is the part that codes for a protein, as well as the regulatory regions like the promoter regions that influence how often that gene is transcribed. So we're going to briefly talk about mutations to both with a focus on the protein coding part. So what if um, uh, I have a string of DNA code? I've tried to make it fairly small for this video. Um, what if we have just a string of DNA code? Um, in order to show you a change, I have to show you what it originally was. Um, so let's say that the DNA code was ACCGAC in a, in a small region of the protein code. Um, that means that its mRNA transcript would be this. And if you were to use a codon chart, which you would need in front of you, um, then your amino acid sequence here might be tryptophan and leucine in this particular sequence. So what if I changed one of those letters? Um, this is what's sometimes referred to as a substitution mutation, because we're just switching one letter for another. We're not adding or removing letters in this case. Um, what if I made that change? 
um, then I would still have UGG and CU, but now it would be CUU. Um, if I look at my codon chart, I find that CUG and CUU both code for leucine. In other words, the DNA code changed, but the amino acid that it coded for did not. So we use the metaphor of silence here to connote, um, we call this a silent mutation, and the idea is that a mutation occurred, DNA code changed, but it didn't cause an effect. It was silent in its uh, effect on the protein. Phenotype will not be affected at all. So if we go back to our codon chart, we notice that silent mutations, as I showed in the last example, usually involve a change in the third letter of a, of a codon. Um, or again, it's uh, mutations are in the DNA code or what will be the mRNA codon. Um, although the third letter changes may not always be silent. There are a few cases, like I'm looking in this region of the diagram right here. Notice that you've got quite a few of the third letters. U, A, U, and U, A, G code for very different things. So sometimes you might not get um, a silent mutation if you switch the third letter. Um, but there are other parts of this codon chart, um, including the one we just saw, um, but also this one right here, the arginine group, um, is CG, and it really doesn't matter what the third letter is. Okay, so the other possibility for a substitution is simply that it changes the amino acid. So I didn't change the first, uh, the third letter of a codon this time, I changed the first letter. So I've still got UGG, and now I've got GUG as my transcript. Um, that's still going to code for tryptophan, but GUG, according to my chart, is now valine. So the question is, okay, um, substitutions might cause one amino acid to change in the protein sequence, uh, but the question is, um, does it really matter if just one amino acid changes? Well, the answer is it really depends. Um, in a very famous example, sickle cell anemia is a human genetic disorder um, caused by a mutant version of the gene where just one amino acid is changed in the hemoglobin protein. Um, but interestingly enough, what it causes is, um, this is the mutant version of the protein over here, it causes the certain subunit of the hemoglobin to sort of clump together and co coagulate. So if a normal protein is supposed to just sort of build, uh, exist in the cell and, and, and result in an overall kind of biconcave, circular-shaped blood cell, when all of the hemoglobin proteins inside of a sickle cell patient um, develop, um, they can form these long rods of protein. That's what they're trying to show right here. Um, these extremely long fibers of hemoglobin protein kind of accumulating, and, th and that amazingly changes the entire shape of the red blood cell. Um, so much so that maybe when as blood is flowing through their uh, capillaries, um, some of these sickled cells might actually get caught and, and cause the um, anemia symptoms, sharp pain, fatigue, um, that's characteristic of the sickle cell phenotype. So in some cases, one substitution might cause a dramatic effect, um, although in other cases, maybe just one substitution doesn't change the protein very much. Uh, maybe a substitution occurs in an area of a protein that just isn't all that important for the active um, binding region or interaction regions of a protein. Um, if a mutation were to occur over here and kind of create the kind of a slight um, extra section, um, maybe that doesn't cause much of an effect at all. Um, whereas maybe a mutation in the active site might impede the ability of the substrate to bind, so maybe um, substitutions can impede protein function. Um, it's also fair to say that maybe even um, mutations might um, um, improve uh, protein function. Um, what if a mutation kind of opened it up a little bit more um, or somehow um, kind of changed its shape uh, let me see if I can change the, uh, erase what I've drawn here. Um, maybe we can make the binding site even more specific for that um, particular substrate. So maybe um, a, a mutation actually um, increases the likelihood that just that chemical substrate binds to the active site. Um, you're, you're effectively increasing the selectivity of a protein by mutating its active site. So sometimes mutations might be beneficial.
Um, remember down here we also talked about the concept of allosteric sites, um, regulatory sites that maybe um, regulatory molecules can bind to. Um, if you mutate that allosteric site so that it, um, let's say an inhibitor can no longer bind there, that might cause interesting protein phenotypic effects as well. So an inhibitor can no longer bind, that protein effectively can never be shut off. So it still works, its active site is still able to bind to substrates and cause them to turn into products, but you can never turn the protein off. Might that cause some kind of effect? Sure, it kind of depends on what the protein is. So all we're trying to get across is that mutations can cause lots of interesting potential effects on protein activity. We haven't even done covering all the, the types of mutations yet. Um, could a substitution cause an extremely deleterious effect um, on the protein's um, amino acid structure? Absolutely. I switched another letter here, this time in the first codon. Um, so let's um, write out the mRNA. Now I've got U, G, A, C, U, G. Um, and if I were to split that up, I find that U, G, A actually codes for a stop codon. In other words, um, maybe the, the ribosome would connect all of the amino acids prior to this mutation, um, but then it would stop right there and it wouldn't add any of the amino acids that might be part of the normal protein structure. Um, this would almost certainly, depending on where this premature stop codon occurred, this would almost certainly cause a non-functional protein to be built. So sometimes substitutions can have humongous effects. Frame shift mutations are another type of, of mutation, and these almost always cause um, deleterious effects. You can um, either cause a frame shift by adding in a letter or by removing a letter. And the reason why we call this a frame shift mutation, let me go ahead and write in the letters first. Um, for the mRNA code. The reason why we call it a frame shift mutation is because remember if you add in a letter we have to read um, the, the mRNA in groups of three letters. So the key idea here is we might be shifting the groups of three. Um, it used to be that we read ACCGAC, um, or excuse me, in the mRNA code we read UGGCUG, but now we're reading UUG. Um, G was put, the second G was pushed over to GCU. Um, and every single codon afterwards will be shifted a little bit. Well, this will almost certainly cause for different amino acids to be um, placed. So UUG I have is leucine. For GCU, I've got alanine. Um, and you would imagine that all of the amino acids from there on will probably be very different. This can also happen if you remove a letter. So I removed the initial A this time. Um, and so now I'm going to um, build my mRNA transcript. We're assuming that it moves on. Um, and that I'm making new groups of three once again. And GGC codes for glycine. Um, and we would have to see what the, what the remaining code is. Um, this will almost certainly um, change all of the amino acids after the frame shift. It might even mess with the stop codon that was normally coded for. So in other words, the protein, uh, the ribosome will just keep adding amino acids until it finds another stop codon in the code. So almost certainly frame shift mutations cause proteins that are non-functional because they have such different amino acid sequences. Okay, mutations can also occur in the regulatory regions of genes. For example, the promoter region that we're going to talk more about in future chapters. So um, since those regulatory regions control how often RNA polymerase comes to transcribe the gene in the first place, the effect really will be here that it will alter how much mRNA will be created and therefore ultimately how much protein will be made. Uh, 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 created. So um, that'll be really interesting because that could also affect phenotype depending on whether making more of that protein um, causes some kind of effect or making less of that protein causes some kind of effect. Um, it also matters where the mutation occurs. Um, maybe in certain somatic cells um, the mutation is very destructive, but maybe those somatic cells can easily be replaced by neighbors that don't have the mutation. 
Uh, gametes are of particular interest to us in terms of mutations because if those gametes, sperm or egg, go on to fertilize, then um, the offspring will have that mutation in every single one of their cells because remember that they're just going to copy that original DNA through multiple rounds of mitosis and so every single one of their body cells will have the mutation. In fact, where we're ultimately um, bridging now is the concept uh, that we ought to revisit of what alleles really are. Alleles are simply uh, mutated variations of each other. Um, maybe in Mendel's purple versus white flower coloration, um, I believe the purple flower is sort of the original DNA code, um, and that the white flower is this mutant version where they're not making the pigment like they normally do. Um, because that maybe that mutant version of the DNA code is um, uh, causing a non-functional protein to be produced. Um, hunt, uh, uh, and, and so you might think then, therefore, that mutations are always recessive. That's not always the case. Um, in some cases, the mutant version of the gene might be problematic, even if there's just one copy of it. That's why perhaps Huntington's disease, um, whatever gene is, is going on wrong there, causes neurodegeneration of, of nerve cells. Um, and just one copy of that is enough to cause the problems, so it's, it's, it's sort of genetically dominant. Um, so mutant alleles might be dominant or recessive, and um, they might be passed through families. Um, originally, someone had the founding mutation in the, in the gametes, so that got it started in the family. And if it was some kind of mutant variety that the person was able to um, have children and, and pass it on, that's how it passed through the family pedigree. All right, so we've talked a lot about mutations, what exactly they are, um, what caused them, and most importantly, that they can have many, many, many phenotypic effects potentially, um, from no phenotypic effect at all to a very slight phenotypic effect to a very major um, effect on protein activity and therefore probably a major effect on phenotype. So this is going to be important because when we discuss evolution, um, Darwin needed a source of genetic variety, and though he didn't know it, this is where um, genetic variety originates, in mutation and in all of the effects that it can cause.